Should baseball players be the only ones judged on their batting average? I'll be right back. We're being treated to a barrage of column and commentary ridiculing those who urge aid to South Vietnam because failure to support an ally would have a domino effect on other allies elsewhere. James Reston of the New York Times a week before Easter discounted the domino theory as having no validity. He says that two small Asian nations can have no bearing on the real international problems confronting us. He says the domino theory is almost as obsolete as the game of dominoes itself. Strange that so many members of the press who insist that every statement ever made by an office holder be brought forth whenever they think he's guilty of inconsistency have never thought of making the record public where their own pontifications are concerned. These men and women write with presumed authority on any and all subjects and influence public thinking to a great degree. But would their influence be so great if, like ball players, their updated batting averages were published with their columns and editorials? Those familiar voices we hear telling us after a presidential address what it was we really heard. Those who told us Castro was no communist, Ho Chi Minh was another George Washington, and Mao Tse Tung and the Red Chinese were just agrarian reformers, never remind us of how often their pronouncements were wrong. For example, a few years ago, President Nixon made the hard decision to mine Haiphong Harbor and stop the flow of ammunition from Russia to the North Vietnamese. He made it on the very eve of the summit meeting in Moscow. All arrangements had been made for the trip and most of the better known news analysts who had accompanied him to Peking were all packed for the trip to Russia. His announcement of the action he planned against an enemy who'd been killing American fighting men for several years stunned these analysts and brought from them a flood of criticism. Eric Severide, I would suspect that the summit will not come off. That was the mildest, although it was delivered with an arched eyebrow. Charles Collingwood, certainly the Moscow summit meeting from which so much had been expected is now in jeopardy. Marvin Kalb, one casualty of the president's mining and blockade may well be his upcoming summit to Moscow. Those who began packing and dreaming of caviar are beginning to unpack and are returning to dry cereal. Well, that was cuter than the bare announcements of John Chancellor, the summit is in jeopardy today. Then there was Richard Valeriani's shocked question, how can they receive him now? Well, Ted Koppel answered him, I don't see how he can go. Edward Stevens said, the president's announcement will be pretty hard for them to swallow. It practically killed the prospects of a summit. So spoke the great modern day pundits, most of whom then dutifully accompanied the president to Moscow a few days later to report on the very successful summit, which all agreed did much to lessen world tensions. To my knowledge, none has ever acknowledged the president had been right and they were wrong. Nor have they given credit to the mining and the bombing of Hanoi for finally bringing an end to our participation in the war and the freeing of our prisoners. Ironically, the Russians were so afraid the president wouldn't come that Henry Kissinger, at their invitation, was already in Moscow to calm their fears and assure them he would really be there. Tomorrow I'll get back to the domino theory and whether it's real or imaginary. This is Ronald Reagan. Thanks for listening. Yes, Virginia, there really is a domino theory, and sad to say it's working right now. I'll be right back. Those who ridicule the domino theory believed in it when Hitler was picking off small nations in Europe 37 years ago. They just don't believe it applies when the enemy is communist and the countries losing their freedom are Asian. The term domino theory describes what happens to our allies if we back down and let one be taken over by the communists because we don't want to be bothered. The enemy decides it's safe to go after others, that we represent no threat to his aggression. But even worse, our allies, no longer able to trust us, start making deals. One can almost hear an echo of the hollow tapping of Neville Chamberlain's umbrella on the cobblestones of Munich. But this time the appeasement is taking place in the halls of Congress. When we withdrew our forces from the long bloodletting in Vietnam, we did so with the understanding that we'd provide weapons and ammunition to enable South Vietnam and Cambodia to resist if the North Vietnamese violated the negotiated ceasefire. Well, violating agreements is standard operating procedure for communists. They violated this one 72,000 times in the first 12 months, including the cruel denial of any word about our 1,300 men who are still listed as missing in action. That, incidentally, was a major point to us in the negotiated ceasefire. So far, they've thumbed their noses at us and refused to allow any of our 31 search teams to set foot in their territory. We do nothing because the Congress has taken from the Commander-in-Chief the authority to take any action at all to enforce the terms of the treaty. Now that same Congress, with unprecedented irresponsibility, has refused to authorize the money that would permit our nation to keep its pledged word. The dominoes begin to fall. 
Three years ago, I represented our government in Thailand to assure them the president's trip to Peking did not mean we would abandon Thailand and close our air bases there, a major part of their economy. Now they tell us they don't want our bases. They're going to do business with Red China. The Philippines, whose history and existence as a nation is intertwined with ours, have announced they're reassessing their relationship with us and are negotiating with Red China. Japan, the great industrial power capable of modernizing and arming a communist Asia, has just opened discussions with Hanoi. But the dominoes are worldwide. Secretary of State Henry Kissinger returns empty-handed from the Middle East. A few months ago, the power and reliability of the United States had brought the Israeli-Arab conflict closer to peace than at any time in 50 years. Now there's talk of war by summer. The press described Kissinger's eyes as wet with tears of frustration. Our power and reliability are no longer believable because of our failure to stand by an ally in far-off Indochina. Turkey stands aloof, snubbing us. Greece, the southern anchor of the NATO line, leans leftward and no longer looks forward to visits by our sixth fleet in the Mediterranean. And with Portugal going communist at the other end of that ocean, the sixth fleet may soon find it must withdraw or become a model ship in a bottle. Once the dominoes fall, we may find ourselves very lonely indeed. This is Ronald Reagan. Thanks for listening.